Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Carrie Fuquay, and I am responsible for marketing here at Telemetry. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can hear my screen. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is, is how successful companies are attracting more diverse candidates. What are some of the best tools and sources to find those diverse candidates? The importance of terminology, both from a sourcing and attracting perspective. How the candidate experience can be personalized for your strategic audiences. And what results you can be measuring to continually improve your diversity recruit hiring. So we are so excited today to have a panel of experts with us. Um, I mentioned my name is Carrie Fuquay and I'm responsible for marketing here at Telemetry. Also joining me are three great panelists um, who have tremendous amount of experience in this area and are, we're so pleased to have them sharing with you some of their hints and tips and suggestions. So Dean DaCosta is uh, a highly experienced and decorated staffing professional, recruiter, sourcer and manager who also has an outstanding experience and skills in human resources, project management, training, and process improvement. Dean is best known for his work in the highly difficult security and mobile arenas and gold star winning numbers he has produced. His keen insight and creation of groundbreaking tools and processes to enhance and change staffing as we know it have proven that he's a true staffing thought leader. Despite all of this, he remains first and foremost one of the top sourcers, staffing managers, and full cycle recruiters in the industry and true search authority. Lori Sylvia is the founder and CEO of Rally Recruitment Marketing, which is an online community forum where the best ideas in recruitment marketing are learned and shared to help you gain new skills, advance your career, and deliver greater business impact. A former CMO, Lori has 25 years in marketing and communications with vast experience educating practitioners about recruitment marketing and creating the new product category of recruitment marketing platforms. And our third panelist, Stephen Schwander, is the Director of Client Solutions here at Telemetry. Stephen started his career in 1997 as a contingency technical recruiter for Wall Street Talent. He has 18 years of progressive experience in talent acquisition, including serving as the Director of Global Operations for Reuters. He has significant talent acquisition operations and enterprise implementation experience with several global clients across finance, manufacturing, telecommunications, and technology. He enjoys helping telemetry clients meet today's recruitment sourcing and marketing challenges. So we're thrilled to have such a great panel. If you do have any questions, we're, this will be a panel format. If you do have any questions, please feel free to put them into the box on your panel, the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll try to cover as many as we can at the end of the presentation and the panel discussion. So our first question that we'll start with is how are successful companies attracting more diverse candidates? And Laurie, we'd love to start with you and, and get your perspective and, and your thoughts on this. Great. Um, thanks, Carrie, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be a part of this discussion and um, and to kick off the topic, I guess, at the top of the funnel, um, thinking about attraction. And first, I just want to say that this is a topic that's really personal to me. My son has autism, and he's currently in high school. And as a mother, I've been seeking to really create acceptance for his differences and help him find places where he fits. And so far it's been, you know, what classrooms and what activities he can excel in, but soon it will be colleges. And then right after that, it will be jobs and employers. So when I think about attracting diverse candidates to our companies, I, I think about it as a mother and also as a marketer. So when we look at the top of the recruiting funnel, how do we attract diverse candidates to our companies? And I think that there are several aspects that we can think about including in our recruitment marketing plans. And the first one is around strategic objectives. So what is our leadership team's commitment to diversity and inclusion? 
The second aspect is employer value proposition. So do our employer value propositions reflect that commitment? The third one is around audiences. What audiences are we trying to attract to our companies? Um, and, and can we identify what groups are being underrepresented on our teams and in our company as a whole? The fourth one is what messages are we putting out there that will communicate our values and who we'd like to recruit? And finally, the fifth one is what channels are we using to deliver those messages and reach those audiences? And so I wanted to share like several examples of, of each of these um, from employers and, and, and how they're doing it. So um, if we can look at the, the strategic objectives, um, I think that something we've seen recently and probably I'm sure you've seen it too, uh, we can go to the next slide, Carrie, is, um, is in the last several years that there's been a, a lot of leadership teams making bold public pledges towards diversity and inclusion. It's not something that is just an HR or a TA goal. It's definitely reached the corner office and also the boardroom. And, and there are several high profile diversity initiatives like Intel committing to spend $300 million or Ericsson pledging to achieve 30% women by 2020 or Accenture to achieve 40% women by 2020. Um, and some of you may have even seen this organization called the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. And maybe some of your employers are even on this list. It, it started out with 150 and, and now there are 350 CEOs who have signed the pledge to, to create basically um, their own organization that advances diversity and inclusion. And, and they're doing it not only because of the business reasons that um, have become clear about the value of a diverse workplace, but also they're looking at it from a societal issue as well. Um, so I think that these public statements and pledges are important, but if you think about it from your perspective in HR and talent acquisition and recruitment marketing, it's really your role to make them happen and also to hold the company accountable for, for their progress. Um, so Let's look at one example from Eversource. And, and they're starting with their employer value proposition. And you know, just as a reminder, your EVP, your employer value proposition, it's a statement that defines your why. What do you offer employees? And why should people want to work at your organization? And so if you're trying to increase diversity and inclusion in your workforce, you need to review your EVP through their eyes. So if it's been a little while since you've created um, your EVP statement and the pillars around your EVP, like this is a really good time to refresh that as you go into 2018. And what are you offering to employees and how do you fulfill their why, their reason and their purpose for working? And what Eversource has done here is they've, they have an entire um, page about uh, why work here. So this is where their EVP is listed, but it includes their diversity and inclusion statement. And I've seen a trend more and more um, on career sites that are including content about their DNI commitment. I mean, we used to see simple EEOC statements, but you know, maybe there was a page targeted to veterans and transitioning military, which is important, but now it's become much more strategic messaging that's directed to all, all, to all diverse candidates. Um, the next thing is, you know, as you look at your EVP and you've, you've made sure that the, the top level message that you're communicating as an employer is, is, is including this diversity and inclusive um, position that your company is, is striving for, Candidates want to know right away about your values and your culture and what it's like to work at your company. And they want to know who works at your company. And, and so this is a question that I've often heard asked among members of the rally community and in, and in other events that I've attended. It's like, well, what if we're not really where we should be? What should, what should those pictures look like? What should those photos look, look like? And the best advice that I've heard is that Use real, real employees, don't use stock photos because you want to mirror your target audience, but do it authentically. And if the diverse groups are currently underrepresented, be transparent, but communicate your objectives, that this is something you're striving to do. Um, the next example is uh, around our message. So 
our message needs to be thoughtful and it needs to be more thoughtful than it has been. Um, there are messages that we could put out there proactively, but then there's also messages that candidates are getting about our company from many other sources. Um, there, the new uh, talent board research just came out and uh, for the, the North American uh, Candidate Experience uh, Awards report. And they found that 29% of candidates are using review sites like Glassdoor in their job search. And this is up 23% from the prior year. So these, these kinds of um, online resources are becoming more and more important. And it's where companies are, uh, excuse me, empl employees are, are researching um, potential employers. So take a look at your, your reviews on sites like Glassdoor, Indeed, Fairy God Boss, Kanunu, there's a growing number of these kinds of sites. And look at what people are saying about the diversity and inclusion environment at your company. And, and respond to those reviews and find a way to manage and sort of balance your reputation and, and communicate authentically and transparently where you are again and where you are striving to be. And the last thing I wanted to touch on sort of at the attraction phase is that when we think about attracting diverse candidates, we need to reach candidates where they are. And there are many communities of interest that you can tap into um, for your recruitment marketing efforts that can reach millennials, women, veterans, and these are just some of the examples. Um, some of these opportunities are free and some are paid, but they provide a way for employers to reach these communities and essentially market themselves and their job opportunities. Um, so whether it's an employer profile that you can find on the Muse or Fairy God Boss or it's a veteran career fair, um, don't forget your own channels like your social channels. And a lot of things, uh, a lot of the, um, the, peop the recruitment marketers that I talk to don't yet have their own career channel through, through social and it might not make sense at their company. Um, this is an example from Hilton Careers, but you might not have dedicated careers channels. That's okay. Partner with marketing and promote your DNI messages as you share other careers content through your corporate channels. So I think, you know, though, that's um, hopefully a good way to kick off this discussion, thinking about it from the, from the top of the recruiting funnel down. And those would be um, the ways that I would uh, uh, share some best practices from the rally uh, recruitment marketing community about attracting um, diverse candidates. That's great. Thank you, Lori, for sharing all of those ideas and, and things that you've seen work elsewhere. Um, Stephen, a question to you. From your experience in working with customers, what does it take to support all of this and, and how are companies actually going about all of these different strategies and tactics? So I was thinking about this as I was listening to all of the content that, that Lori was talking about and you know, really a, a system that's going to allow you to manage all of this content you know, from a single place so that you have uh, control over what messages are going out, where those messages are going out. As people interact with the messages, you, you have uh, visibility into uh, what kind of traction these messages are getting. And a lot of it depends too on how much of the messaging is employee related. So uh, what I would call job content or career content um, versus I've, I've spoken with some clients where you know companies are, are actively involved uh, with diversity issues in the community. Um, and that's part of the EVP from a perspective of, I want to work for a company who cares about the community, uh, but it's not direct EVP in, in, in that it's impacting what my career might be like in that company. So a good example here, I, I'm, I'm based in the St. Louis market, and um, you know over the past couple of years, we're all familiar with the challenges we've had in the St. Louis market, um, uh, particularly in, in uh, some of our communities of color. And there's some wonderful, I, I won't bring them to light here because I don't have permission to talk about them, but there's some wonderful companies that are starting to open up uh, you know, new opportunities for work sites in some of our uh, difficult communities. Well, that that's not necessarily an EVP per se, but because they're involved in uh, areas that I'm in concerned about, it makes me want to work for them, right? So uh, there's a lot of those messages that are out there as well. So I think 
uh, you know, content management, understanding where the content is and being able to, tr to uh, track what kind of traction that content is getting, both from an interest and engagement perspective, but then as we'll see, you know, further on in the conversation from a conversion uh, perspective too. So how am I taking people who are interested in my messages and converting them, if not to applicants, at least perhaps into my CRM? Great. Great, thank you, uh, Lori and Stephen on that. So next we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, sourcing. Right, and what are some of the best tools and sources to find these diverse candidates? Um, and Dean would love to call on you to share some of um, some of the tools and sources that you found to be the most effective. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, first of all, the slide you see up there right now is um, some of the words and um, associations and whatnot for different diverse classifications that you can use when doing the Boolean string or pretty much doing anything. As an example, and I'll, I'll, I'll use Munster as my example, if you're a Munster and you're looking for a female Java developer, you obviously you put in Java developer, but then you can add in any of these other words like witty is women in technology international. Uh, wit is just women in technology. So you, if you added wit or women in technology, the odds are pretty good whoever comes up is going to be a woman. And so a lot of people need to understand when looking for diversity, a lot of it is based on the words you use, the phrases you used, and the things you use that can help target whatever the diverse class you are, whether it's women, African-American, Hispanic, Native American, veterans, people over 45, or people with disabilities. Those are the biggies that are out there. Now, there are some tools out there that can actually help you do that. As an example, there's a tool called SeekOut that actually has a very good diverse filtering system where you could filter for veterans, filter for women, filter for Hispanic, uh, filter for um, African American, and I believe Native American is coming. I don't think it's there yet, but they have a very good system for doing that. Um, there are other tools out there that actually will pre-populate your strings for this. Um, the social talent Boolean building tool actually does have a, a where you can pick what diverse class you want and it will pre-populate your string with certain words that are going to probably hit what you're looking for. So like I said, the, the one you see in front of you is, is some of the words you can use for women. I mean, Girl Scouts of America, not a guarantee. There are some men that work there, but a pretty good shot. Um, the Women's College Coalition, well, enough said. Uh, just simple terms like she, miss, misses. You know, a lot of people write their resume and they'll say um, she was a gifted engineer and blah, 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 blah. And so when you see those words, you go, oh, she, well, must, you know, got to be a, a woman. Uh, you also see the very top link is a link to baby names, and it breaks it down by male and female. And so you can even do it by name. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that's a long string, but it is a way to do it. Can you move to the next slide, please? In front of you is a string that lists every single fraternity out there fraternity being female. So if you look female and they say they were a member of Kappa Phi Zeta, they were a female because males can't be part of it. So there's another way in which you search. Now, you're not going to be able to use all of these terms because uh, Google only accepts 32 words, but you can do a couple at a time. I mean, you only need so many candidates. But uh, when searching for women, this is the way you would target them and, and have a pretty good shot at knowing they are indeed women. Next slide. Women colleges. These are colleges that pretty much either only admit women or mostly women, depending on things like the Women's College at the University of Denver. That's a specific part of the Denver College. It's just for women. The Randolph Macon Women's College, uh, Notre Dame College of Ohio, uh, Mount Vernon College. These are either only women or predominantly women. And so you have a pretty good shot. If they went there, they probably are a woman. Uh, next, please. Now, before I get into this age thing, let, let, let me just make a point of note so you understand. I, When I'm talking about diversity, I'm not just talking about because I'm just somebody that looks for diverse candidates. I actually am Hispanic, way over 45, and a veteran. So I'm actually three of four diverse classifications myself. So this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Now, once upon a time in Google, you could use something called a number range to look for dates. 
whether it be graduation dates, usually what you want. So like if I want someone over 45, right now, you put 45 to 1965 and that's 2010. So they're definitely over 45 if they've graduated in those dates. Google right now will not allow you to do that in a free Boolean search. However, if you use Google's advanced search function, which you can you know, just put Google advanced search in Google and it'll come up with the page, they still have that functionality there. So you can still search by number ranges, which in this case, we're looking for dates. If anywhere on the resume, they have dates within that range and you can actually up that 1965 to 1975 now, they're over 45 because they did something during those dates and those dates are way, you know, that, they're going to be over 45. Um, you know, I'm over 45 by 10 years and my birth date's in that range. Um, so, and that's just my birthday. Forget the fact that I won't put that on my resume. If I say I graduated from college or high school in those ranges, I'm over 45. So that's a good way to do it. And probably the only real way to do it, to be honest with you, because unless you know their birthdays or unless you're gonna actually ask them what you can't, it's gonna be hard to do. Next slide, please. African-American, same thing as before. Um, the term African American. I don't like searching for the for the term black, but I will. Um, at times, the problem is it'll give you some false positives. Um, there's an article right there that lists the HBCU schools in America, basically the black schools in America. So you, there's a link you can go and you'll see all the different black schools or predominantly black schools. And then there's also one there for popular African American names. I mean, there are some names that pretty much are specific to African-American. It's just like there's certain names specific to Hispanic. My correct pronunciation of my name is not Dean, it's actually Dion, and only Hispanics pronounce it that way. So it'd be pretty easy to figure out. Um, next slide, please. Of African-American fraternities and sororities, and then some more colleges. So Alpha Kappa Alpha is a fairly predominant African-American sorority or fraternity. So if you put those in there, the odds are pretty, pretty good. For those of you wondering um, and have watched Revenge of the Nerds with the with the fraternity that they joined, which was a predominantly African-American uh, fraternity, uh, while not listed, it really is a real fraternity and it really is African-American. <laughs> so you could actually do it. I forget, it was Kappa, Kappa Nu or something like that. I don't remember the whole, the whole one. Uh, and then there are some colleges that are either only African-American or heavy by African-American, Tuskegee University and so on. And so again, these are Boolean strings or things you might put in a database when you're searching or a um, job board when you're searching because, you know, if they went there, there's a pretty good shot. Uh, next slide, please. Hispanic, near and dear to my heart, being Hispanic. 100 most, most popular Hispanic baby names right there. Um, other things you can search on is countries. A lot of times if they came from Brazil or Mexico or Spain or wherever. And I know some people say, well, Spain, that's not really considered Hispanic. That's European. Well, actually, according to the Department of Labor, no, it's Hispanic. <laughs> um, so so um, as you see underneath, it says Hispanic or Spanish or Latin American or Latino or Latina. Well, those are words that if they're in there, they're probably Hispanic. Uh, next slide, please. And there you go, associations, National Society of Hispanic MBA, colleges, University of Texas, Pan American, Hispanic fraternities and sororities. And by the way, even though I didn't list any of, of the African-American, there are African-American uh, associations. Uh, I believe there's a Society of Black Engineers is one of them. So if they're a member, they're African-American. And these are some colleges and stuff. Yeah, that's good. So Native American, this one is tough. Because first of all, what percentage? <laughs> um, I don't remember because it's recently changed like six months ago, but the, the uh, governments to, to be classified here, there's a percentage, believe it or not. It's not just if I'm 0.00000, 10 billion O's one um, Cherokee, I'm a Native American. That's not quite how it works. So this, this one's interesting because what the government might see as the percentage and what people might see as a percentage of two different things. I know people, if they have anything, that's what they are. I know others where if it's not at least 10%, you know, so just keep that in mind. So terms, Indian, Native American, tribe, chief, American. Indian. Now, some of these could get you in trouble. Tribe and chief could bring some false positives. Same thing with Indian. 
uh, but not as much. I mean, they could say they played for the Indians and they're an ex-baseball player, so that would get a false positive. But for the most part, you should be okay. You got a link to the more popular Native American names. Natural Society of Black Engineers is listed here because, believe it or not, and some of the other black associations, organizations, there are a lot of African Americans who actually have Native American blood, which I found interesting. Uh, I didn't realize that. Actually, it's estimated 75% of, of them do, which pretty interesting. Colleges, University of Texas, Pan American, University of Texas, El Paso, all have fairly large uh, Native American. And then you see some of the um, fraternities. Some of them look like they should be uh, Hispanic. The, the, they are, but they also ha have a lot of Native Americans in them, which is why they're listed here and not back in the Hispanic area. Next slide, please. Disabled. Now, disabled is tougher than heck because most people aren't gonna list it on their resume. And so it's a matter of, of trying to figure it out nebulously. <clears throat> and so the best way I found to do it, there's some actual draw boards there that cater to disabled, the disabled. There's associations that cater to disabled, like Disabled American Veterans, disabledveterans.org and stuff like that. So that's some of the best ways that I have um, learn to look for disabled. Other words you could try, depending on things, is like Braille. Believe it or not, some people will list Braille as a language. Well, great. I mean, if they've got Braille, there's a pretty good shot they're, they're, they're disabled because they're more than likely blind, not necessarily. Um, at one point, you could use any of the sign languages, but now you can't because a lot of people learn sign languages to have it. My wife knows sign language. I know a little bit. So that doesn't mean we're deaf, but you know, so there's certain things you can do. It's one of the toughest things to search for because most people will not put that they're disabled on their resume or profile. And you're not really allowed to ask. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> veterans. Veterans is probably the nearest and dearest thing into my heart when it comes to diversity. Uh, I am a veteran, um, and, and, and I don't think we as a country or society do enough, but here are some terms. Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard. Yes, the Coast Guard are military. National Guard, Army Reserve, Army, Force Reserve, so on and so forth. Um, pretty much the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, they all have the reserve versions. Um, so you can use them. Now you got to be careful because you just put in the word Navy, you're likely to get um, old Navy if you, and stuff like that. Um, so you got to be careful, but for the most part, you can be okay. And there's different variations of the words. It could be U.S. Army, then there's acronyms. And I think later on, I'm going to actually show you that. Organizations, VFW, DAV. And if you see that link, that's a whole lot of veteran service organizations. If they are members and or work there, the odds are pretty good because these organizations tend to only hire veterans. And the reason for that is real simple. I mean, who can better understand a veteran and what they're going through than a veteran? It's kind of like who can better source and recruit for a veteran than a veteran. A veteran's more likely to um, um, trust another veteran than they are to trust a non-veteran. Other words, acronyms is we're just going through veteran, obviously, military, USMC. Now, be careful with the veteran because believe it or not, veteran could get you veteran football players and baseball players. So you got to be a little careful. Military, USMC, United States Marine Corps, U.S. Army, USAF is the United States Air Force, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Navy, VET. Former can get you in trouble, but might work. Most of us will not go, will not say we're former. Most of us will say retired or prior. And then there's a whole bunch of links there with a bunch of acronyms and a bunch of abbreviations for branches of service and all sorts of stuff. So you can go there and figure it all out. Um, next slide, please. Clearances when dealing with veterans. One of the biggest reasons for hiring a veteran is clearances because they have a clearance, secret, top secret, whatever the case may be. I'm not going to go through every one of them. There's hundreds of thousands of them, but there's a list that has most of them. Uh, the only ones you don't see th th on there that uh, they don't have that they have are ones that are so high they're too secret to even know unless you already have one. Uh, you can also search by our agencies they work, federal agencies. Uh, a lot of times it's veterans working in those agencies. And then you can also source by companies supporting federal agencies, um, defense contracts and stuff like that. A lot of times they have a large population of veterans. I know my company does. Next slide, please. Now, um, 
these are some of the best sources to find diverse candidates. So um, there's, in this case, there's just a bunch of uh, links to articles I've written that might help when hiring veterans and understanding diversity sourcing part one, part two, there's actually like six parts, but once you get to one, you'll be able to find the others pretty easy. The other thing on my webpage, which is weebly.thesearchauthority.com, I have a section just for veterans, which is going to list a lot of places to find veterans, a lot of places to understand what veterans are going through, uh, just a plethora of information. There's probably over 300 links to different pages to help when it comes to veterans. Um, so that's a good place to go. Like I said, seek out's really good. Just reaching out and asking. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to say this, and this is off script. If you're going to go after veterans, you got to think about what are you offering, because if if, if you're basically going to sit there and say, yeah, we want to hire veterans, and if you're still a uh, uh, National Guard and you get called up, we're not that okay, fine, we can't guarantee your job. You're not really wanting to hire a veteran. It's just like a diverse diversity candidate. There's certain, uh, not diversity, excuse me, uh, someone that has a disability. There's certain things you're going to have to do for people with disability. If they're in a wheelchair, you got to make sure wheelchair accessibility and stuff like that. If, they, if they're if they blind, you got to make sure their computer is braille and, and all that stuff. And there's either braille readouts or there's a, a vocal readout of whatever's on the computer or whatever, or neural, or neural interfaces, which believe it or not, do exist. Um, same thing with veterans. We want to go where we're going to be appreciated. Veterans are going to work hard. They're going to do their job and they're going to be loyal. But we want to be where we're appreciated. I'm going to give you an example. As much trouble as they're in right now, Sears uh, Holdings has one of the best veterans benefits programs I've ever seen in my life. Basically, if you get called up to active duty, they continue to pay your salary for up to five years and guarantee you the same job when you get back. Not just a job. The law says you have to give them a job, but the same job. That's phenomenal. That's just, and that's why a lot of veterans went to work for Sears Holdings. Home Depot, they have things where you got your weekend a month, we go ahead and let you go. If you got your two weeks here, we let you go. If you get called up, we guarantee your job and come back. And we do, I think they pay their salary up to a year. But they, if you go to Home Depot, you'll notice there are actually parking spaces just for veterans. And that means a lot to us. So you got to decide, are you really going to be a vet? One, or, or do you just want to hire a veteran? Or are you really going to be veteran friendly? Because we do our research. And here's the really big thing. We are a family. We are a community. You treat a veteran bad, everybody's going to know about it. You're going to play heck trying to hire a veteran. I know a company that treated a veteran really bad. Borderline should have been taken to court. And that person ended up leaving the company. They could never get a veteran to even interview there again, all because of the way they treated one. We talk. Treat us good, we treat you good. You treat us bad, that's a problem. So I, this is all off script. A lot of this is from my own experiences as it relates to veterans because I've been in these situations myself. Um, so, I mean, I've been treated badly. I've been discriminated against because I'm a veteran because people just don't like them. I've had been stopped on the street and yelled at by people why their taxes pay for my benefits when they when when they don't feel they should. I mean, it, it could be bad. You'd be surprised. So keep in mind, you're looking for veterans. Great. But but. What are you going to do for them? What what is what what makes it? Why should they go to work for you any more than anywhere else? Anyway, next slide, or, or is that it? Oh, questions. I am done. And who's next? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thanks, Dana. I'm so glad you went off script there, because I think uh, it's those personal stories that really make this um, so relevant for everybody. So the next question we wanted to ask our panelists is, what's the importance of terminology? Um, and I think that this is really both from a sourcing perspective as well as um, job descriptions and sort of outbound marketing. Um, so, uh, Dean, to not give you a break here, but to kind of get your input um, on the importance of keywords and sourcing a little bit, would love to hear your perspective. Well, here's the reality situation. Um, no matter where you search, whether it's a database, your ATS, your CRM, free Boolean, seek out, uh, hire tool, no matter where you go. And yes, those are both tools. Uh, who knows? I could name hundreds of tools to help you find people and stuff. It's garbage in and garbage out. You don't put in the right words, you get in the wrong people. 
It's that simple. If you try to say, I want a embedded Java developer and you just put in Java developer, you aren't going to get embedded Java developers. Well, you will, but you won't, they'll be mixed in with a whole bunch of others. And if all you do is put Java developer, uh, you're going to get people that say they have Java and have been develop and have been a developer, but that doesn't mean they're a Java developer. Why? Because you didn't put it in correctly. You put it in quotes. Um, so it, it's like anything, it's garbage in, garbage out. You don't put in the right information, you aren't going to get the right information back. And for those of you thinking, well, I don't have to worry about that. I use an AI. Here's something for you. Who made the AI? A human. Humans, by nature, are faulty and make mistakes. Therefore, an AI will have mistakes and will have faults. They may learn as they go, but will they learn quick enough for you? So don't think an AI is going to answer the question for you. It's garbage in, garbage out. You're looking for a Java developer, an embedded Java developer, and you're doing a Google search, you're probably the best bet is putting embedded near in quotes Java developer. What will that do? That'll make sure the word Java developer is together, which means they are one. And it'll make sure the word embedded is within 10 words of the phrase Java developer. Now, why is that important? Well, if you don't, you may get somebody who's a Java developer now and they were embedded developer, but that was back when COBOL was the programming language, which is like 80 years ago, and they haven't done it in 80 years. So that's not an embedded Java developer. <laughs> so garbage in, garbage out. And in a job description, it's really, really simple to find what you should be looking for. First of all, job descriptions, most of them suck. But besides that, you're always going to have, this is what they have to have. This is what we'd like them to have. And this is what we'd love them to have if they could walk on water and turn bread into uh, water into wine and, and stone into bread and all the other things that people, that people can't really do. Um, Always just start with what they have, the minimum must have requirements and make sure they're real. I had an experience with a hiring manager, one of the job developer, and they wanted him to have a CISSP and a network uh, Windows NT certification and another security certification. And I was like, that makes no sense. So I called him up and, when, and I wasn't the recruiter, I was the sourcer. I called him up and asked questions, come to find out he just wanted somebody with those skills. They weren't gonna use them, they just wanted somebody. Well, no. It's hard enough finding job developers as it is. You're going to add in CISSP. By the way, there's only like 300 people in the entire country at that time anyway that had CISSP and were Java developers. Oh, and had a security clearance, by the way. So make sure you have the right minimum requirements and go from there. If you get too many results, then you can add in the nice to haves. Make sure you do your Great. research Thanks, first. Steve. Okay. I had more. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, Lori, anything else from your perspective that you've seen to share with our audience? Yeah, I think um, when, when I think about this topic, about terminology, I, I, I think that this is a really important place to think about um, the inclusion aspect of diversity and inclusion, because we're trying to make our, our teams, our, our companies um, more accepting um, of all of all audiences and groups, and you know, one of the th things that that we often see is where the the job is described. You know, it's using terms like we're looking for superstars or rock stars, and, and this this can be off putting to some people. Or we describe our benefits like we have beer and foosball, but you know, what about the paid parental leave or childcare assistance? Those things are important to uh, people who are a little bit older, people who have families. Um, I know that this is, this is a really hot topic, particularly in the technology space and in startups, which, you know, have been, some have been accused of having cultures that are really, um, and even recruiting practices that are really geared towards, um, you know, a younger, a younger demographic. So, um, so, so that's important. The other thing is um, one of the best practice recommendations that I've seen is gender neutral titles and even checking your job descriptions for pronouns. Um, so those are just a few things that you can do. Just take a fresh look at your job descriptions, look at the terms, look at it again through the eyes of the audiences that you're trying to, to attract. Um, there is there is a tool um, that you can use. There's probably several, but there's one that I'm aware of called Textio, which can look at your job descriptions automatically. 
and they use machine learning um, to help figure out which job descriptions are, are performing the best. Um, again, there's probably several other tools out there, but um, if, you're, if, you're dealing with, if you're dealing with recruiting at scale, um, you know, a tool might be useful, but if, if you're a small to medium-sized company and you're hiring for, I don't know, less than 100 people a year, probably you can handle the, 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 the thorough review of the job descriptions on your own. So the next question we wanted to ask our panel is, how can the candidate experience be personalized for strategic audiences? Um, so Lori, would you mind sharing your perspective on that and help our audience to better understand how they can do that? Yeah, great. So uh, personalization in recruitment marketing is a really hot topic, and, and, and it it's really goes back to the what's in it for me. Um, message, the WIFM message that uh, that I learned a long time ago when I was starting in marketing and communications. And I think that, um, you know, when we look at uh, this topic, we should probably think about it maybe in three ways, or these are three examples of how you can do it. And one is through targeted campaigns. Another is through landing pages when you think about the career, uh, the candidate journey. And the third one that is becoming more and more important in our recruitment marketing strategies is, is social uh, recruiting or social media recruiting. It's, it's there's several terms for that. Um, so let's look at one example um, on personalization. And this is a, uh, a company called Tenable, and um, they're a security uh, uh, company in the technology space. And they created a targeted campaign that included this video to help them attract more women in technology roles. And they used this video as part of um, the marketing that they did around their attendance at the Grace Hopper Conference, um, which, is, which is a great uh, place, by the way, if you're uh, looking at events um, to connect with women in technology. Um, and this video was created by their recruitment marketing intern. So it, it doesn't take um, a lot of resources sometimes to put together a video, and um, you can find this on YouTube by looking at Tenable's um, YouTube channel, and you can see that they're, they've got women in all kinds of technology roles, and it's just an opportunity to ask them, you know, what, what is it like to work here? What, what is, what, where, how do you find meaning in the work that you do here? Um, so, so this, and this video that was created for that event can be used in many other ways to promote this diversity initiative. Um, the next one is um, thinking about the candidate's journey. Most job seekers start with search. Um, and so this is an example that, you know, if you were thinking about a particular employer, like maybe 7-Eleven, and you wanted to know about jobs for military, you know, you could start out with that, with that Google search. and 7-Eleven has thought about this in, in advance, and so they've created a landing page, and they've optimized it for SEO so that someone can land on this landing page and hear more about how 7-Eleven offers careers for people who are transitioning out of the military or, or veterans. And so, um, again, think a lot about your your landing pages. They don't. They they probably shouldn't be specifically a job landing page, but to start with. A landing page about about this uh, targeted towards this audience or the other audiences that you're trying to attract. And then the the third example I wanted to share around personalization is is, is around social, um, because you know beyond promoting your jobs, it's really important uh, to to connect and engage with your audiences through through social by sharing content that is valuable to them, that is informative, that helps them with their career, and that also shows what it's like to work at your company. And, and this, is, um, this is taken from um, the Rally Community, um, Seattle Children's Hospital, I think does a great job with their social, um, their social recruiting. And they had a nurses uh, camp that they, that they offer, and, they, and they, the way that they promote this, one of the ways is through social, and it, it goes right to a landing page 
that describes this program, but you can see here that diversity is just an integrated part of their message, both in the photo that they use, but also like it's the second paragraph when you when you land on this on this page, and it talks about how they're looking um, how they diversity is important to them in their organization and how they're looking uh, to to have more diverse people um, join their organization. So um, I think in all of these cases, it's it's just the, the diversity and inclusion message is just integrated right into the photos, the, um, the, the messaging, the content that these recruitment marketers are creating. Great, thanks, Lori. Stephen, from your experience working with clients um, and their candidate experiences, do you have any other thoughts to share with our audience on how they can personalize that candidate experience for their different audiences? Sure, I think absolutely. You know, this is a strategy that is for marketing, you know, regardless of what your target, you know, population is, right? So in terms of making sure that everything that Lori said, that, you know, as people, you know, self-select into an experience, meaning I'm, I'm interested in diversity, they click on, uh, on you know, a, a page, they end up on that landing page. You know, from my perspective, I want to make it as simple as possible then once they're there, to convert in any way that they want to convert. So if they hit, you know, um, in, in the 7-Eleven example, for instance, if they hit on the uh, military landing page, because that's the Google search that they use, you know, right on that same landing page where we talk about hiring military, let's have some options for them to quickly apply for a job that might be uh, available or uh, even join a talent network uh, or register their interest uh, or create a job alert, right? any way that gets them to convert so that we can now have um, a, 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 an identifiable contact associated with, uh, you know, that candidate so that, you know, down the road now we can do more uh, proactive marketing uh, to a more diverse population of people. Uh, we can give more personalized experiences when they come back, uh, you know, next time and let us know that they're, they're back and, and things like that. So I think really, um, you know, paying attention not only to what messages we want to share, but then paying attention to how quickly we can convert people and when we convert them, um, how we can personalize that experience to what, uh, you know, based upon what we know, is going to be uh, important for them. Great. Thanks, Stephen. So the last question we wanted to spend a couple of minutes on was what results should we be measuring? Um, so, Lori, would love to hear your perspective on what are the most important metrics that organizations should be looking to measure so that they can continually improve? Great. I mean, analytics is such an important topic um, that's discussed so frequently in, in recruitment marketing and in recruiting in general, but, but definitely from a recruitment marketing perspective, because I think that the discipline is still emerging and people are not really sure how how they should measure the effectiveness of their results, and that includes when they have initiatives to, uh, around DNI. So, the first thing I would suggest is that if if your organization, if your leadership um, has made commitments and pledges around uh, creating a more diverse and inclusive work workplace, that um, Someone needs to hold them accountable to that, uh, and and particularly for you for the your role in in that. And so um, I don't have this as an example here, but there's a company called Atlassian, and you can go to atlassian.com/diversity, and um, and they report publicly on their own results um, towards um, their diversity goals, which I think is great. I mean, it's just. Again, it's part of the transparency, and no organization is perfect, and, and everyone is, is striving to, to do better and be better. Um, so tracking those strategic objectives is, is important, and, and also your, your leadership will want to report that back um, to their leadership and their board, so be prepared that you'll be getting questions around it. The next area I would say is around pipeline growth. And this is tough, and, and we, we Stephen and Dean and I had a conversation about this prior um, to, to the webinars. We were talking about this, but, you know, it's difficult to, to identify people, uh, you know, in your CRM unless they self-identify. But, but there are, you know, using the source, for example, that they came from can help you to know 
um, if your pipelines are growing for the particular um, diverse candidate audiences that you're trying to attract. And then I just think it's like the, the, the fundamentals, you know, the, the leads converting into applicants, converting into interviews, converting into hires, um, you know, and, and, and measuring that along the way, um, as well as the candidate experience. I mean, if you're, if you're specifically taking on some DNI initiatives this year, this is a great time. I mean, you, I would say you must alongside of that implement some way of measuring candidate experience, um, including surveys and feedback, because especially you need to know if the, if the effort that you're putting out there is working, if it's connecting authentically with this audience, if they feel like they have something um, that they feel at welcome, if they, if they feel included in, in how you're recruiting them. Um, you can identify things very rapidly here and make changes uh, also rapidly. Um, otherwise, half the year will go by and you'll be missing your targets. Um, and the last way I would say is um, is on the engagement side. And, and for that, I, I, I think about um, social. Um, and, you know, social is a way where you can see who is following and liking, um, you know, what it is that you're putting out there. Um, and, you know, Dean would remind me, well, maybe the picture that they use isn't necessarily, you know, who they are, but you can start to see if, if how you're doing, if, the, if your messages are, are, are resonating with your audience. A, a quick way to, to, to know that is the feedback that you get through your social media content. Great. Stephen, did you have anything else from your experience in working with clients on this topic? The, the only thing is, I, I think that's a great um, you know list of, of metrics uh, to, to measure. I think you know the the, the challenge continually is um, you know I, identifying um, who you're trying to track, and I don't mean on an individual level as much as uh, um, a, a way to identify your diversity traffic um, and your your diversity pool in a way that really helps you know whether or not all of these activities are increasing the diversity in your pools, right? Um, and so it really takes a, a uh, and, and since, you know, from a recruitment marketing perspective, we're talking about pre-application here, uh, it's really important for me to understand, you know, do I have a diverse pool that I'm marketing out to, right? Not, not that I'm marketing out to a specific class of people, but within, uh, within my group of Java developers, right? Uh, do I have an inclusive pool that I'm marketing this Java development job out um, as I'm sourcing and uh, putting people into short lists and pipelines, you know, um, you know, am I doing that in a diverse way so that, um, you know, recruitment naturally is pulling up, uh, you know, di diverse uh, pools of people. So that pipeline growth um, is really, an, and the pipe, you know, the pipeline growth as well as the, the pipeline reporting, I think is really uh, you know, key and important to, uh, to drive success here. Well, that's great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so with that, just a reminder to our audience, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put those questions into the question box. We have had a couple of great questions come through. I want to make sure we have just a couple of minutes here to cover them before we hit the top of the hour. Um, one that I think is pretty quick, uh, question to you, Dean. Did you say that Sears will pay the salary of the vet for five years or benefits? Why they're on active duty, if they could close back to duty, the Sears, it's Sears Holdings, just so we make sure we understand that, will pay for the, the vet's salary, benefits, everything for up to five years. It's almost never five years. Nobody gets called up from reserves to active duty for five years, at least not anymore. Back in the day, maybe, but not anymore. So it's usually only a couple of years, but they're willing to go up to five years. Now, that's not the norm, just so you understand. That's going way above and beyond. Um, the norm is a year and guaranteeing their job when they get back. Good for them. And we're happy to get a plug in for them for that. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> given what's going on with Sears right now, I'm not sure how much of a plug it's going to be. <laughs> um, question, um, and I, I, I think, Dean, this is best targeted to you. We live in a time where uh, there was a couple questions about gender diversity, um, and 
we live in this time where gender diversity is more than just women and men. How do you anticipate sourcing will change to include transgender or gender fluid people? Well, that's an interesting um, question because a lot of that is really going to depend on the federal guidelines and state guidelines as it relates to those subjects. And as you, for those you know, that um, there's been some changes in that just with, you know, with every new president, there's a new thought process or lack thereof. And um, so, so it really going to depend. If they do what they should do, then we are going to have to, they will be added to the list of diverse classifications and we are going to figure out how to um, source and recruit for them. Now, how are you going to do that? That's going to be really tough because most people aren't going to sit there and tell you they're a transgender or whatever they are. They're not going to tell you that. Uh, so that's going to be really, really, really tough. Um, what I think will happen is they will be added to the list of 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 a of a diverse category, but I don't think it's going to be something that you're going to have to worry about the government saying you don't have enough transgender in your company. And the reason is because that is next to impossible to really know. I mean, I I know some transgender, and I'll be honest with you, I couldn't tell. You know, and I'm pretty observant being ex-military. I, I'm very observant. I couldn't tell. Um, you know, so I don't, I, I, that's what I think will end up happening. I think they will be added. It'll be something that the government will ask you to report on just if you can't just say, hey, if you know what, how many type of deal. But I don't think it's going to be like it is with some of the others. And that's just because of the nature of how difficult it is to really know. I think I think uh, you know, Dean, it's interesting. I actually did some interviewing along this realm uh, relatively recently as well, and and you know discovered that uh, you know some of the obvious challenges there are even in our application process. Um, you know that that's very gender specific and, and and not helpful in the transgender world. And I think secondly, much like you said about the military earlier, Dean, uh, this is a this is a community of people who care and are and uh, about people who treat them well. And so everything that Lori talked about earlier in terms of messaging, uh, you know, I think is very important here, particularly for organizations that are looking to attract. So it's one thing to be compliant. It's another thing to say, well, we're looking to attract another area of diversity because we think that's going to help us create better products, do better customer service, et cetera. So I think for those uh, clients, that whole messaging is really important and being able to you know, serve that population with what they, what their, uh, you know, requirements are, uh, you know, go a long way toward helping to attract. Yeah, I agree. Um, Stephen, we had a couple questions here about um, how, what tools can be used to track all of this, right? We talked about the importance of tracking it um, and a question specifically about using Taleo as a system of record. Um, which we're happy to talk to. We at Telemetry are our gold partner with Oracle, and we do integrate with Taleo. So, of course, we're happy to talk about that. But, Stephen, could you give a little bit of advice on tools to uh, track that funnel? Sure, absolutely. Taleo would certainly be something you would use to track post application. Um, and then, you know, you've got all the compliance issues that are um, inherent around tracking applicants. Um, from a marketing perspective, uh, I think it's really beneficial in, in this incidence to have a, a CRM tool where you're really able to track, you know, I, I, I you know, my, I, I'm amazed at how much sourcing, you know, Dean does and, you know, every point of source and, and, you know, all these disparate places, I'm, I'm like going crazy thinking if you found one person in every one of those disparate places, where now do you track and, and build relationships with? And I think that's why you know the, the CRM tool is probably important at that point, um, so that you are able then to track uh, you know what the result of all your sourcing and marketing effort is, and then uh, more importantly have that place where you can build a relationship that ultimately will lead to the ultimate conversion, which is application and and hire. So um, you know I think from a sourcing perspective, you know Dean's got his finger on all those fantastic places to source uh, outside of typical integrated sources. Um, all of the um, you know data elements that Dean you know uses in uh, open web searches can also then, if you have a powerful CRM tool, be used to help track and build uh, diversity um, you know pools within your CRM as well. Yeah, and the interesting part about that is there are a lot of tools out there that can make the incorporation of your results into your CRM seamless. 
Yep. Um, you know, if you're in Chrome and you do a search and you do um, job developer, women in technology, and you get your results, you can literally upload the entire thing into your CRM and then just start contacting people. But the thing to remember, and this is very important, and this is where uh, recruiters and sourcers and stuff need to do their work. 95% of all the people you contact before they decide if they want to re reply or connect with you or anything are going to check out, check you out. They're going to look at your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Twitter to make sure it's worth their while. What am I going to get out of it? If all you have is five people connected on LinkedIn, how's that going to help me down the road? If you got a few thousand, now it's talking. If you got a few tens of thousands, now you're really talking. Because that means if I connect with you, all these other people and I have connections, and if I ever need something, I've got all your people I can go to. It also tells them that you're serious. You're a real recruiter, not just some database recruiter that can't spell Boolean, that you're a real recruiter. Don't laugh. I just did a webinar with 400 people, and I asked them how many people had x-ray. Five. And x-ray to me is very basic Boole Boolean mm -hmm stuff um so you got to understand recruiters sourcers researchers you got to do your part too you got to make it clear to people you can help them because it's like it was mentioned earlier what's in it for me they don't give a flying flip how great your job is they don't care how much money you're going to pay they don't care about any let me phrase that they don't care how much they can help your company they care what your company can do to them how much will you pay them how good are the benefits can they work from home can they get promoted will it help them with their next thing well i really want to ultimately be a a software development manager um will can this can this new job be the next step to get me there that's all they care about what's in it for them and until and prior to talking to you the only way they can tell what's in it for them is how serious of a recruiter source or researcher are you how many connections do you have that could help them great that's way off script <laughs> <laughs> no it's great um and so thank you all um i know that we do have a few other questions that have come in um but since we're past the top of the hour um, we're going to have to wrap it up here, but we certainly will follow up with you via email to answer all of those remaining questions. Thank you so much to Dean and Lori and Stephen for great insights and experience and expertise to share with our audience today. Um, you will, to all of our audience, you will receive all of the PowerPoint decks, and I know that there were some additional questions to make sure that you guys have all of the uh, acronyms and, and some of the terminology that maybe were not in the deck, so we'll do our best to get that to you. Um, but if in the meantime, I um, hope everybody has learned something today, and I hope everybody has a great weekend, and we will talk to you soon. Take care.